This time on episode 483 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we talk the Kids WB show X-Men Evolution Season 1, Episode 7, Turn of the Rogue, and Episode 8, Spike Cam. I'm SP from the GuineaGeek.com show, a weekly geek news podcast that is part of the GuineaGeek.com network. Just like the show you're checking out now, shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other amazing geek shows at GuineaGeekNetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. And now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Agent Lauren. I'm Agent Michelle. I'm Agent Chris. And I'm producer of the show director, SP. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. The show is recorded on Saturday, September 2nd, 2023. Live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast Bayville-wide, including the mountains and the caves around it. Come and join our live chat as we record. And if you didn't already catch on to it, we do like talking about Marvel. Because secret secrets are no fun. Secret secrets hurt someone. If you'd like to talk to us about secret secrets, you can find us at our website, legendsofshield.com. You can leave us a message about your secrets at our voicemail, 844-THE-BUS-1. That's 844-843-2871. If you know the secret name that the Bird app is actually going to be called when we can get it flipped over into something else, you know, because X is stupid, then make sure to tag us at Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. when you tell us, because we want to know what we're going to be calling the Bird app. You can join our Discord server and talk secrets at gunnageek.com slash Discord. And remember, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the gunnageek.com network. If this is your first time joining the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we appreciate you stopping by and we hope you have a good visit. If you're a longtime listener, thank you for coming back again today. We're going to be continuing our journey down the X-Men Evolution Path Season 1. And we are excited to get to that. You guys ready? Yes. Let's go. Yep. X-Men Evolution. Season 1, Episode 7, Turn of the Rogue, premiered on Kids WB February 3rd, 2001. And Spike Cam episode eight premiered on Kids WB on February 10th, 2001. Michelle, I love you reading off the IMDb description because it gives me an idea of what happens in these episodes other than the titles. So what do we got? Turn of the Rogue. Scott Summers and Jean Grey prepare for the Geology Club excursion. But Mystique has different plans in mind, replacing Jean with Rogue in an attempt to put further distance between her and the X-Men. Spike Cam. Spike receives a video camera for a class assignment, but the camera is found by Wolverine's nemesis, Sabretooth, who uses it to find out where the Xavier Institute is in order to hunt down his rival, Wolverine. All right, first thoughts. Lauren, what do you think? The moral of at least Spike Cam seems to be that if you have a problem, you can just dump it in snow. Oh, God, is this how I was in high school? Oh, I sure hope not. This has so many Buffy high school vibes. And poor Sabretooth will never remember Kate and Rogue dancing in the woods. Got mind wiped there. All right, you definitely a lot of high school stuff. Before we get into it, I just want to say that in... My high school career, in my freshman year, the last day, one of the seniors rented a camera and took it around and filmed everything. And then a couple of years ago, I would think it was just before the pandemic, he had that transcribed. So I see all my freshman classmates, actually sophomore, it was my sophomore year, all my sophomore classmates running around the hall taking their last final. 
it was very, very eerie. And unfortunately, even I in high school was like this. So I went to high school at the tail end of the 90s, early 2000s, as we have previously discussed. And those little mini video cameras were a thing. And we happened to have one. So our teachers were doing stuff like, okay, my favorite example of the you have to make a video for class was instead of reading Romeo and Juliet my freshman year, our teacher was like, just use the script format and film something and we're going to show it and give awards. So my group decided to just throw together instead of writing anything throwing together a plot we just threw together a bunch of running jokes and the movie ended up being about one of my friends who got pregnant and then every time someone would ask who the father is a dog would walk by we would all stare at it until it walked out of frame and then she'd turn and go some guy we also did the safety video for one of my health classes i was in a health and science magnet school where we did like a good idea, bad idea thing where we would show people like getting their hands sliced open on glass and trash cans and getting their hair set on fire because they didn't pull it back while working near a burner. So we did stuff like that. And then after hours, we did stuff like one of my friends wanted to be a music video director. So I would be the storyboard artist and director of photography and film it. So we would, this was very, very familiar to me. We had to do a few video projects in school, and one of the genius moves I think that I had was nobody ever had credits in their videos, or if they did, it was just handwritten on a card or something. So I would make PowerPoint presentations and literally film the monitor as that was going through to have the credits and play music as I was filming it so we could have end credit music. And I wouldn't, I didn't tell anybody how I did it until the end of the year. And then everybody was really mad because they didn't think about that for themselves. I had left school before this whole craze had happened. I had graduated before then. Oh, darn. In a way, I'm grateful for that. So all I had to do was write papers and do posters and dioramas. Those are the things that I got to do. However, when I became a teacher, I allowed students if they wanted to, like when I had a project for them, if they wanted to do, they could do a play, they can do a video, they can make, you know, a poster. I, I, I would have let them explain themselves, you know, express themselves in a variety of ways. The best video that we got was of a student who filmed, he had a pet snake. He filmed himself feeding. He, he filmed his snake eating because he's like, here's that. And I'll let it go because it's biology. And he told everyone that it's that this is what I'm going to show. And I allowed anyone, it's like, well, if you're going to find this uncomfortable, you can put your head down, but you're not allowed, or you can leave, but you're not allowed to disrupt it. Cause the, the, if you stay, I'm going to take it as you're going to accept it. There was a little like, kind of like, ooh, sort of things, but there was a lot of like, whoa, cause it was you, the snake actually, you know, got around and everything. So I, I had some, I had some interesting videos but talking about i did <laughs> the one that i wish was a video but was a play was talking about health and safety my students we did a health class and it was about smoking and to this day i remember they did a play and it was you know about smoking so they had one smoke cigarette all of a sudden get cancer and then die and then the problem was was that she was on the floor and then there was a joke and then she started laughing. And then one student said, stop laughing. You're dead. And it took everything I had to keep it in there. But going from the teacher vibe, poor Spike did a report on the wrong Star Wars. And I'm sitting there going, the teacher needed to have given clarifying directions as to what the project was going to be because there's no way I would have assigned a D. I would not have graded that paper a D 
if he turned in a paper about the Star Wars movie, that would have meant I did not give clarifying directions. And so I should have allowed Spike to rewrite the essay because an essay is to show how well a student can put together those ideas and write and give evidence. You allow him to rewrite the paper. You don't give him a camera and just go do something else. There you go. If you've been talking about the Star Wars National Defense Program in class, though, and like you have the context there, and then you just say, hey, write a paper about the Star Wars program. I don't see how any kid can logically jump to, let me write a essay about the movie. That being said, yes, clarifying directions are important. And I did have a paper in college where, if I'm remembering right, I know it was in a history class, we were looking at political cartoons and the professor wanted us to super specifically talk about a couple of them. And I talked about them in general. And he said that he graded the paper. The way the paper was written completely missed the idea, but C on the paper because of how well it was written on everything. And you know, I could have redone something with it if I wanted to, but I was cool with that grade. So I just let it go. So something that cracked me up during that whole scene where they're discussing that is uh, in the background. Did you know that President Reason is the one who ordered the Star Wars program? <laughs> it, it, it's Reagan, the G, they, the animation, the background animation people turned it into an S. It's a pretty common mistake when background animation in particular is done because those typically get sent overseas to people who don't tend to use the Roman alphabet. So you get stuff like that. I was going to say the clarifying stuff, the directions are on the chalkboard. You see that in the screen. So it was definitely about the strategic defense initiative Star Wars program. It was not about the movie Star Wars program. And Reagan is the reason for a lot of things. Yeah, so many things that we're still dealing with today, even. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So there is that in the, sh the camera, the mini cam. This is before the stabilization software is on board, like your GoPros or your cell phones. So you're going to get shaky cam. The audio is not going to be great. You're not going to have great lighting, that sort of thing. So a lot of people just don't realize you can't just take a camera. I, the cell phones these days take care of a lot of stuff because the cameras do light variation and the microphones are, are stereo microphones and there's processing on board. But those, those cameras, the, there was no chip in them to do any of this processing. So it's really going to be low-grade film. But it was high-grade enough for Sabretooth to figure out where the mansion was, which kind of, I'm scratching my head over that one because I think it's pretty obvious once you take a look at the city landscape where the mansion is. It's not like it was hidden by a bunch of trees. And what's really funny, if you take a look at that shot, it seems like it's out in a peninsula. And then later on, when you have the kids taking their little moped and going out in the woods, it's like, where is that woods? It's, it's nowhere in the scope of Bayville. It's like the mansion is on a peninsula. There's no woods around the mansion. It's like, okay. <sighs> it is protected by variable cloaking technology. Variable. Throw in one of those high-tech words into the cloaking and it becomes good, right? Ah, yeah, the, the whole thing was was pretty good. I did like how Rogue and Kate Pride they they were going at each other, but by the end of the episode they seemed almost friends. That seemed a little weird to me that they were kind of fighting anyway. Like Jason did not seem like the kind of person Rogue would be romantically interested in. I mean, I could be wrong very easily. I don't think she was romantically interested in him. She was just like, ew, you like boys sort of thing. I think it was more of you're acting one way and then this boy comes along and then you act a completely different way. And it's just that 
eye rolling. Oh my God. Can't you just be yourself instead of being like, oh, hi. <laughs> yeah, that's how I took it. Overall, it was a pretty cool episode that we're talking about the second episode to do with the spike cam. I think the way it ended, obviously, we're going to see Sabretooth again. I don't know if he's going to remember anything along the way or if he's going to be a blank slate and, you know, have to come down from, I'm assuming it's the Arctic versus Antarctica, but I guess with the Blackbird, it could be anything. So I, I'm going to just going to bet that we're going to see Sabretooth again. It just continues a long tradition of X-Men of somebody has pissed you off. Let's dump them in a snowy environment the thing i always think of is back in the what was it 90s when gambit and rogue finally kissed and then she absorbed his memories of participating in the morlock massacre so she dumped him in antarctica to die she does use that power in the first episode to get the memories of mystique to find out what actually is going on and that, that had to be a lot for her because this is all new to her in this universe it's all new. The X-Men is all new to her and stuff. So she's getting an eye opening right from Mystique's mind. And that, that must have been a huge shock. So I really don't blame her for her acting in the next episode because she's still like mentally dealing with all that stuff. Yeah, the problem with lying to someone who can take your memories is that they can take your memories. So good going there, Mystique. And the whole Magneto Xavier meeting that occurred, that was interesting. I think this is the first time that they've been face to face. Mm hmm. Yep. In this cartoon. The first time that we've seen them on screen face to face. Yes. And Chuck is figuring out maybe I shouldn't lie to people. Lying is generally not a good move. I can understand why he wouldn't want the kids that he is taking care of here to be going to school scared that the principal is going to literally kill them because that is something that could very easily happen and they do have to go to school. But also when you're putting people into it, you know what? Let's back off of that a little bit. Why is he even letting them go to that school if the principal is mystique and he knows it? He can just homeschool them. He can do all so many things, but he is putting them in this dangerous situation. I have gone from, oh, okay, I can kind of ex understand Charles to, no, Charles, you are a flat out jerk in this because that's a word I can say on this podcast. I get it. It's his whole like wanting, wanting mutants and non mutants to get along. And what better way to ensure that people are around each other than to put them in environments where they will be around each other? But, again, it's run by somebody that you know for a fact hates you and hates these kids for being associated with you and would, wants to recruit them as their child soldiers instead of your child soldiers. And mutants at this point in this series aren't public knowledge yet, so there isn't that whole... You know, oh, we're also doing, not only are you learning how to operate around non-mutants, but non-mutants are being exposed to you and you get to be the good example. So there's problems here. Oh, yeah, there's tons of problems. In the first episode, Turn of the Rogue, you're going to take a bunch of high school kids splunking with just one teacher who's actually driving the bus. And then they're just going to drive these very dangerous and fast snowmobiles. And they're going to go into these very dark caves. Yeah, I was kind of watching this go, and I realize it's a cartoon and everything. But I'm kind of watching this going, especially when they're doing that underground river or whatever. I'm like, where is the light coming from? It should be complete dark. And, and again, I get it. It's a cartoon. But there is no mention of, oh, I can't see. Or what is that noise down there? That sounds like water or anything like that. They just kind of know it's there and there's enough light around and no there's there's not light there's there's nothing there's dark and that's it yeah if you have ever been in an underground cave or cavern it's wild how absolutely dark it gets down there i used to go to the natural bridge caverns in central texas and as part of the tour they take you down there and they shut off the light and it is 
it's that kind of dark where your eyes are making up things to see because your brain can't handle it. Michelle, though, what are the chances of bioluminescent moss or something? Low. <laughs> Denied, Chris. Denied. I mean, yes, there are bioluminescent moss. Ooh, New York State does have a species of glow-in-the-dark mushroom, but they go they grow in the forest. Are they the good type of mushroom? Um, legally, I don't know if we're allowed to answer that. Vanilla <laughs> <laughs> oh, Coop- my, my dog wants to know. Cooper wants to know. He likes the mushrooms. <laughs> also known as the bitter oyster. So, I mean, I guess you could eat them. So it tastes bitter, but what are the after effects? The chances are low. I mean, unless it's the type of cave system that has cracks in the opening that allow the moonlight to filter in and bounce off of the shiny rocks, because apparently there's sedimentary rocks there at the beginning. And, and like, apparently there's also men- there's metamorphic rock and there's a little sparkly. And so now they were going to go find other examples of different types of rocks. And it's like, okay, they've been through a traumatic experience of basically a bus wreck. Let's go via snowmobile. And then, hey, let's have class now. No. That's the best time to learn when your adrenaline is up. You <laughs> tend to remember stuff a little bit more than. Sure. <laughs> this is just irresponsible teaching all around. And I cannot believe I'm <laughs> talking about this. There should be another. Sh- there should be another adult. It's a chaperone. There needed to <laughs> have been an actual bus driver. So, so there should have been two adults plus a j- skilled bus driver. He said that if the snow got thicker, they should have turned around. He actually, at that moment, thought we should, the moment you think we should turn around, we might have to, is the moment you need to turn around when you have a bus full of kids. And it's not like that road was big enough for a bus anyway. There wasn't, that bus wasn't even filled. So why are they taking a huge school bus when they could have taken like one of those bigger vans and towed the, and why are they towing the ski like they were going to let them go ski? This this whole field trip has so many problems just from I cannot believe here I am. I know it's a cartoon, but the teacher and me is just going, that's wrong. Well, that's wrong, too. There need to be two. This, 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 this and this. Like, there were two adults, though. Mystique was there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically. <laughs> and one fewer kid than they thought. So that makes the ratio work out even better. <laughs> true. True. I didn't think about that. Oh. Uh, so correction, Panellus stipticus is not edible, but you can buy kits to grow it just to have glowing mushrooms. Yeah. And set LED lights around your room. Sure. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> when did Rogue learn how to drive a snowmobile? Because she grew up in the bayou, right? So she has snowmobile riding experience. I guess it could be a memory thing, but I haven't seen her take anybody's memory that has snowmobile driving experience. I haven't looked up where she's from in Mississippi, but Mississippi does get up touching some states that do get snow and people can go on vacation. So she might have gone on vacation and learned how to drive a snowmobile there. So a couple years ago, we went on a family vacation to Winter Park, Colorado. And as part of the things there, my dad was like, we're going on a snowmobile tour. I'm like, okay. So we took turns driving. And you can learn it fairly quickly. I mean, I wouldn't say I'm good at it, but... Yeah, I wouldn't be racing cliffside oh, when God, just learning. Oh, God, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, they're called sleds, by the way, up in the north. And 
yeah, they they go really really fast. You can get them up to depending on you know what what type you get, you know how big the engine is, whatever. They can easily go 120 miles an hour, if not not faster. Largely for fast transits on a lake top, which is relatively smooth and flat. But yeah, you can they have some power to them. You can go really fast. And this was 25 years ago. They could still go fast 25 years ago, but they could go faster now. 25 years ago. Dang. Yeah. We're old. Lord, yes. When did Buffy came, come out? When was that? Buffy came out in, I believe, season one was late 96 or early 97. That seems right just from who I remember uh, about it when it came yeah, out. Yeah, 1997. So if the dancing scene was from... Premiered March 10th, 1997. Season three, that would be around 2000. That would be around the same time that this episode came out. So fun fact, in, ter- in, in Spike Cam, that scene where they're dancing after Rogue has taken a little bit of Kitty's mojo, I guess, that dancing is lifted exactly from uh, an episode of Buffy in season three called Bad Girls. It's Faith... And Buffy dancing, Faith is has, is basically being rotoscoped as Rogue, and Buffy is being rotosca- rotoscoped as Kitty. There's a similar scene later on, I think in season two, where they basically rotoscope a scene from the craft. So yes, this show is very aware of what it is. I do... When I watched it, I did enjoy Rogue seeming to enjoy herself, which... You know, typically, you don't think necessarily of Rogue really enjoying herself, but she was having a good time in that episode when she you know, got behind the dancing thing. And just FYI, for those of you who are like, oh, it was the vampire craze. This is before Twilight. This is during the Anne Rice resurgence that I lived through in high school. Twilight, I actually looked it up. Twilight came out in 2000 because I looked, I did look it up. Twilight was published in 2005, so this is 2001, so this is four years before. So if you're thinking, oh, it's the Twilight craze, no, this is, this is Buffy, Anne Rice resurgence, hot topic. I believe this of, is before even Harry Potter, the first movie, at least, came out. The books came out in 97. It was. Right? The, the first yeah. movie came out in 2001. Yeah. So, fun fact about the... Dracula the musical they're doing there is in fact a Dracula the musical but it premiered in 2001 actually it's it's kind of interesting to read up on I recommend it there's some names in some of the various casts that you might recognize an audiobook narrator that I really like actually played Renfield in the studio cast recording in 2011 but before this there is a German musical called Tanz der Vampire Dance of the Vampires That premiered in 2007 that's based heavily on Jim Steinberg, the guy who wrote all the Meatloaf songs. It's based on it. It's his music. The main love theme is basically totally clips of the heart, but with different lyrics. They tried to do an English version. It was a complete train wreck. Again, highly recommend looking up information on it. But the German version I watched while I had insomnia one night. Super fun. Great costumes. So they could have been drawing on that for this. I don't the the vibe is kind of similar to what we saw at the very end of that episode. Overall, I did have enjoyment watching these episodes. I think it was past beyond. I, we were talking about it last time that uh, when are we going to get beyond the assemble the team sort of thing? And even though we have rogue switching sides in the first one, I think this is moving the story forward versus just assembling the teams. And I had fun with these episodes. I think they're finding their foot. They're moving forward. And I look forward to the next few. But how did you guys overall, you know, now that we've talked about it a little bit, like the episodes, Michelle? I enjoy them. Even, you know, the teacher and me had to vent a little bit. But once I got past that, I enjoyed them. I hope we get back to Kurt a bit. You know, he was the first one introduced. and. Yes, I get it. We've had to introduce all of the others. So I'm hoping that we get more Kurt because I like Nightcrawler. He's one of my favorites. 
Lauren, you had some notes on the voice acting. I did. So new voices in these two episodes. First off, Richard Newman as the bus driver slash teacher slash really shouldn't have brought those kids into a cave system during a snowstorm. He also shows up again later as some other characters, namely Omega Red. But you might know him as M. Bison in Street Fighter, the animated series, if you've ever seen that gif. Yes, he is also in Stargate Infinity. But if you've ever seen that gif of Bison going, yes, that's him. He was also in My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic. And then Michael Donovan, who played Sabretooth, was one of the main characters in Double Dragon. The guy who voices Wolverine in this show played the other Double Dragon. He was also a voice in Inuyasha, and he was also in Street Fighter, the animated series, as Guile. And fun fact that I only noticed now, despite the fact that I was watching wrestling at this time, I was still watching during the whole Attitude Era. If you notice Sabretooth's design, he is wearing what is very clearly a wrestling championship belt. So Tyler Maine, the guy who played Sabretooth in the 2000 X-Men movie, is a former wrestler. He wrestled for like WCW in New Japan. I just thought that was funny. And how did you like the episodes overall? Oh, yeah. Fun. Super nostalgic. Again, brought me back to aspects of high school and brought me back to watching Buffy as it came out. and. Just super nostalgic and fun for me. Chris? Yeah, now that we're past all of the introducing the team and getting people in, I mean, those were fun. This is starting to get a lot more fun now. And I can really see why everybody is loving this show and have tried to convince me to watch it for years. Yeah, it's just fun, really. I mean, you can't speak too deeply about it because it's discontinuity with what everything else that we've seen, whatever, it's just a different take on stuff. And I'm actually liking this a little bit better. I mean, Scott's more palatable, right? And you've got uh, Kate Pride in this one, which I enjoy. I, I like that character. It's probably my favorite X-Men, really, when it comes down to it. I don't think we've heard her. You have a note in here, Chris. I don't think we've heard her actually being called Shadowcat yet. Which I think is a little weird because they're calling her that in the intro to everybody for the show. So that that definitely has to be something that's coming up, I think. But, yeah, you know, we'll see. She also does have a tendency to change costumes and code names a lot. And then I, I know that there's this desire to see more Kurt. I think we'll get Kurt, more Kurt in the future. I don't know, but he's a bit, he's a lot to handle. And so, at least the way they've depicted him so far. So I hope they get to even out his character a little bit more, and then we see more of him. So next time, which will be, if you're listening to us live, by the way, it'll be two weeks before we're back, because I have some things I have to take care of. But we're going to continue our watch of Evolutions Season 1, Episode 9, 10, and 11, titled Survival of the Fittest shadowed past and grim reminder oh okay i just missed survival of the fittest in there i was like but we're going directly into shadowed past there's another episode before that turns out i just can't read yeah or maybe you're eating so many of those luminescent mushrooms i don't know (laughs) maybe you just need some glasses so you can read better (laughs) (laughs) well in the meantime michelle what should we do We are going to jump on some snowmobiles and race our way out of here. As I said in the beginning, if you're new, I hope you've enjoyed your stay with us. We hope to see you next time. If you're a longtime listener, thank you very much for sticking with us. We want to hear from you. Either way, give us some feedback and let us know how you're liking X-Men Evolution. Or what you think you would want to hear from us, because very shortly we're going to have a dearth of content. Hey, even after we finish this, I believe it's going to be few and far between. So what would you like for us to cover? So I want to thank 
not only our listeners, but again, my co-hosts for keeping this ship rolling forward and for being so accommodating with regards to what we're covering and everything like that. Thank you all so much. You don't know how much I appreciate you. We appreciate you too, Lauren. We love you and you help us a lot, a lot too. Who else is going to be able to talk about voice actors other but you? And also appreciate our listeners. Thank you very much for people who watch live, listen to us on podcasts. Maybe you watch us on YouTube. Either way, we appreciate you as well. Yes, everybody who chooses to listen to us, there are so many podcasts out there. And the fact that you are choosing to spend time with us is just amazing. And we love every single one of you for it. And I'm going to make the push now. Let's see who wants to watch some of those horrible 1960s animated Marvel cartoons. Yes. <laughs> Maybe get to Spider-Man with the Spider-Man pointing Spider-Man at each other. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. <gasps> no, yeah. worse than that. <laughs> it, yeah, it is. It does the get Captain worse. America one. Uh. <laughs> so when are we going to watch the Captain America movie with Dolph Lundgren? Okay, let's just put it on the list at some point because we're going we're gonna to have some openings, so. Yeah. Wait, wait. Ch- check with the writers and the actors guilds on that one, just to be sure. I'm I'm thinking Good after point. after the strike. I'm thinking if assuming there yeah. is an after the strike. I'm sorry, Dolph Lundgren didn't play Captain America. He was in the running to play, but was busy. Okay. Yeah. Well, we can cover that at some other time. In the yeah. meantime, I'm Director SP. I'm Agent Lauren. I'm Agent Michelle. And I'm Agent Chris. See everybody next time. Bye. 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 Where do you get those kits to grow those mushrooms? The internet. Oh, just Where look else? up mushroom growing kits. Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of Shield, or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. So technically, I have a glasses prescription for the first time in my life. If I was driving long distances more often, I might consider it, but like, I can still read signs at a distance. It's just that they've gotten a little fuzzier. Like I technically still have 2020 vision. So are you just actively avoiding getting glasses? Like you don't want them? Is, no, is that I just the case? don't need them. Oh no. Yeah. You need them. You need them. You should get them. You should I, get them. Your eyes are going to, your eyes are going to start straining and then it'll just get worse. Mm. Yep. But like, yep. I only really vacation. need it for long distances, and I don't now. drive anywhere with long distances. Yeah, and like, then all of a sudden the TV is too far away, and um, I'm thinking next year it might be more worth it because, like, go to Zenny; they're like twenty bucks. <laughs> yep, get your prescription. Go to Zenny; twenty bucks. A couple yep. weeks later, I have the eye measurement thing. That is a little expensive. But once you have that, then your pupillary distance, then you're set. Zenny also has a printable version on the website. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Your husband can do it. He's an engineer. But yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, sweetie. I'm sorry. As someone who pays more for the uh, no line bifocals, this this pair, this pair is just for the computer. So I can mm-hmm. see my entire computer. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. See. I don't know if see. you can see the bifocal there or yeah, not, but yeah, yeah. 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 See, I'm vain. I'm vain. And just to put the so, pressure on you, I will wear the blue light glasses today. <laughs> 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 yeah.
Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2023.